Tiny coffee drinkers and metric system enthusiasts, tuck your kinder in for ein Gutnacht of Schlappen. <laughs> Relax from the strain of your 32-hour work week. And you know what? Maybe you are Euro trash, but maybe I'm a Euro raccoon. <laughs> because it's time to talk tall to me. A Euro trash panda. Yes, a Euro trash panda. They do actually have trash in Europe, contrary to popular belief. But they don't have pandas there. Welcome back. I am Omen Thomas Sade. And I am Nick McGill. Together we are the Feckless Moans. And this is Talk Tall to Me. A long afternoon chat in the street cafe of Prague Rock in which Netherlandish Nick and Orléans Omen will take a long historical view of the collected works of borderless rock band Jethro Tull. Every album a country, every song a charming market square, Nick and I will ride the toad in the hole train from Benefitburg to the arrondissement of Aqualung. We will sip Glugwein in Glory Row. We will chug Chablis on the cross-eyed Mary Champs-Élysées, and we will pour ourselves a pitcher of port in the Paradise Steakhouse. And if we can manage to keep together a loose coalition of the Prague parties, we will elect the finance minister of flutes, the cod piece from Croatia, the Swiss chalet singer, Ian Innsbruck Anderson. And we will do it with style. Well, one of us will do it with style. <laughs> Hello, welcome back, Nick. Omen, it's been a minute. We had a week off last week in terms of our recording schedule. Indeed. I had a visit from my lovely wife here in beautiful Santa Fe. And Nick, how are you feeling? Oh, oh, funny you should ask. I I, I tested positive for COVID yesterday. ta -da! So sorry. Yeah. So sorry. Glad that you are all in all having a fairly mild case of it. Yeah, yeah, last night was a bit torturous, and the headache is gone, and that was the worst part. And, uh, yeah, not not too bad, all things all things told. And now you are on the road to hell. I, I'm feeling significantly better, yeah. German accent always helps that. German oh, yeah, that's that was the only reason. It's like a cat's purring. It, it relieves inflammation. Yeah, it's at a, it's set at a, at a almost mystic level of frequency to heal. I've told you the, the, what the guy, what the German musician used to always say at this German bar that I would go to. He would leave for a cigarette break with his, with his cup of whiskey. And he would always say, my doctor says I have to keep smoking cigarettes. Otherwise, I'm going to die healthy. <laughs> there, there are some people who just accept and embrace their self-destructive lifestyle. Yeah. With style. Emphasis on the style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Self-destructive life. Style. Style. It's just, it's, it's <laughs> italicized, yeah. It's italicized. <laughs> well, I'm sorry you're not feeling well. I'm glad that you're still alive. And Nick, what do we have the pleasure of listening to and then talking tall about on this very fine episode? Well, today, this week, we are going to discuss European legacy. But before we do that, we're going to do a, a couple of more pieces of notes and quotes from Ian about the album. Quote it away. This is, obviously, from Ian. That was following my solo album called Walk Into Light, 1983, where I'd been exploring what was then the new technology of the emerging world that was moving from analog to digital. Mm. Drum machines, very primitive sequencers, and so forth. I thought we could use that on a tall album. It's got some great songs, and it's arguably the one album where I really pushed myself as a vocalist. It's a great album apart from the drum machine. It annoys me to this day, and the public didn't like it either. I'm glad I did it, though. <laughs> Wait, can you go back a sentence? He's, he's talking about this whole album? Yep. It's a great album apart from the drum machine. It annoys me to ah. this day, and the public didn't like it either. Specifically, I think he's referencing the drum the machine. Drum machine, there, not, not the, the album, album as a whole. Yeah, yeah okay. Yep. Further on, the one regrettable thing about the album is that wretched drum machine relentlessly boring a hole in your skull because it's got some great songs on it. And it was one of Martin Barr's most inspired moments of guitar playing. Mm. I think in a way he felt that he didn't have to worry about keeping time with a drummer who was never perfect. 
All he had to worry about was playing the right notes. If Steve Wilson ever has a passion for wanting to remix under wraps, I would agree on one condition, that he finds a drummer. <laughs> well, I was, you know, immediately I was going to ask, you know, is there, is there a world in which Ian Anderson, with whomever he deems fit, were to sort of Taylor Swift style re-record this material? Right. And I would volunteer to play the drums for that. So you would do the exact opposite of the the mathematical precision and perfection of a mechanical drummer. I would bring balance to the universe by my complete lack of rhythm. Yes. Okay. So you would you would exemplify that that imperfection. I would. I would. It would be a drum. What's the opposite of a machine? A chaos hole. Yeah. I'd be the drum chaos hole. You'd be a drum. You'd be a drum rock. <laughs> you'd just be a. <laughs> And then uh, finally, in reference to the drum machine itself, you could be a Luddite and ignore these new instruments, or you could say, well, let's give it a spin. Let's see what it'll do. And so I chose the latter course. You have to push the boundaries sometimes. I think that's great perspective and really fits into, you know, what we often talk about, Tall, in terms of being a prog rock band, they are progressing yeah. through history. They are progressing into new territory all the time. And, and it's not, you know, not every experiment is going to yield the results that you think. Right. Some experiments yield more questions than answers. And I, I know we've had this discussion in the discord in the past, the, the idea of them re-releasing under wraps with an actual drummer but we've also been told that Broadsword and the Beast is going to be the last of the remasters. Unfortunately, it, it, if that is the case, it falls just short of one album. I wonder if they'll push it. It Though we can say it will fall, it is the last of the intended Steve Wilson remasters. That's true. There may be remasterers yet to be born into this world. That's true. And also the fact that he, w w the reason given is that they're starting to get into territory where stuff doesn't really need to be remastered the way that Steve Wilson can get in there and really work the pieces and parts. But the argument can be made for Under Wraps that it does warrant a remaster. It almost needs to be unmastered. <laughs> unmaster just the drum track and then remaster it. This album needs to become ungovernable. No masters can have any influence over it. I would buy that album. I'd like to hear that. Speaking of blurbs, I will blurb a blurb to you. This is from the book Silent Singing, an mm -hmm. excellent tome. Ian says, European legacy reads like an anti-Brexit pro-EU rationale, a mere 35 years before its time. Hmm. There we go. Let's keep that in mind as we listen to European legacy. Let's keep it in mind and have a listen. Well, Nick, I think that to talk about this song, I'm going to need the assistance of a non-alcoholic beer. Nice. Classic. Classic omen. I've decided to, now that I'm in my young and fun years, I've decided to start experimenting with sobriety. How's it going for you? Good? It's wild, man. It's, it's wild. I get sleep every night. I'm hydrated. It's amazing. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Okay, European Legacy. Nick, there is a lot musically going on in this song. Yes, it is. It is very mild compared to what we've been hearing so far. Just as a note, this is track number three off of the album. We've heard Lap of Luxury and Under Wraps. Eins, zwei, drei. It's track, track number dry off of this album. And, and it's, it's a bit mellower. It's, it's almost acoustic. Practically. There's a big acoustic element in it. We have yeah. Ian playing the acoustic guitar throughout and underneath a great deal of it. I believe the bass is electric. I don't think this is a, like a, a double bass or a stand-up or anything. And what else? Oh, the flute. We got the flute in here. Big heavy flute presence. We also have Martin on the electric guitar. I want to talk about the vibe of this song. Okay. 
So you've said it's mellower. I agree. Yeah. Although there's no lack of exciting synth work in here. It's in here. The synth is in here, but it's it's more subdued. It's like it's pulled back. You know, it's it's not vying to be in the front like the last two were. Same thing with the, the drum machine. Certainly the drum is, is a lot more pulled back. I totally agree with you about the drug... The drug machine. I totally agree with you about the drum machine. I feel like the synth is is pretty ingrained in this so that's interesting that we kind of hear that differently it doesn't stick out to me like it fits in it melds better than the previous ones maybe that's what what i'm trying to go for do you think maybe the flute being so present in this song kind of Hmm. provides that middle ground so that the the synth isn't having to do all of the melody work yeah and and the really and just in terms of of meeting it halfway in 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 the pitch, uh-huh. you know, so it's not just that really high pitch synth and everything else kind of flows underneath. There's right. there is that bridge there. Yeah, I think that's a decent assessment. I largely enjoy the sound of this. Not that that's relevant to this discussion, but I do largely enjoy the sound of this of this song. There are a couple things that really delight me about it, and some things that feel a little bit like guilty pleasure about mm. it. Okay. So that wonderful flute intro that Ian does, the ba 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 da ba ba da Yeah, it's super trilly. Yes, he's doing yeah. a lot of flutter tongue on yep. the flute there. And obviously the drum machine is very thick backing it up. Yep. That intro has a different feeling to it than when the verse starts. There's a really funny kind of break in between that intro and the verse. And both of them are, seem to be expressing this kind of mysterious, seductive mm. attraction, perhaps, but in quite different ways. Yeah, absolutely. There, there is a, I don't know if it's like a minor key or a, there's, there is a darkness to it that leads you to, to not be fully in your comfort zone. That's right. Know? There's a sense of mystery. It's like, yeah. it's like you're having a delicious meal and then someone says, and now you will eat a snail. And you go, ooh, oh, ooh, eat a snail, eat a snail. Gonna eat it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, so we're we're taking an exotic cuisine, uh, a, a, a nouvelle cuisine. Uh, yeah, would you say, or an uh, oyster perhaps. bar? Why are they serving snails at the oyster bar? I don't know. Mollusks, I guess. They <laughs> These all aren't have shells. snails. <laughs> have you ever eaten a snail, Nick? I have. Yeah. How do you find them? In a shell, usually. <laughs> out, I go out in the garden. Nice. The couple times I've had it, I mean, the whole point of snail is just literally drown it in butter and garlic so it's I, I don't really see the point they were it was a little snotty it was a little chewy yeah yeah i find them delectable but i mean a big part of that is the butter and garlic yeah yeah and and then dipping the bread in the sauce at the bottom of the bowl oh yes the yeah. snail sauce yeah the snail sauce yeah and then so when we have the verse come in we have ian's Wonderful guitar, wonderful acoustic guitar. It's so great to. It's always so great to hear that. Yeah. Dun, dun, ba, dun, dun, ba, yeah. It's dun, ba, super dun, light. Dun, dun. Everything is is really pulls back, and it's just it's just a little strummy. It's that intro is is a very interesting stretch of, for lack of a better term, hard instrumentation. There, there's yeah. it's hard playing, and I don't think it ever quite reaches that level of intensity. The rest, like it picks back up, but it's. Maybe it's just because it starts right out of the gate so hard that it feels so forceful. Yeah, that's a good point. We do actually have the flute momentarily take up that riff again later in the bridge. Mm. But it's interesting that you picked up on the lightness of the song. And I think that there is something that will... I think that ties into something that we'll talk about in the second half of the show when we get more into the kind of meaning behind the song. But I feel like there is this sense of of lightness and freedom, but also not understanding everything necessarily and, and mystery. Yeah. I, I, I want, I have a comment to carry on with that, but it, it does belong in the second portion. So yes. You know what? Let's be laissez faire. Oh, about our structure. Let's break down. 
let Mr. Gorbachev <laughs> break down that song. Break down that song. <laughs> what is your thought? That feeling of mystery. Yes. And not being full, like in your comfort zone and everything. It, it, a part of it to me feels like if you're going to a new country that you've never been before, sure. you know, that's the layman's take on this song as opposed to our, how it fits to our spy novel. Yes. Subject, you know? Yeah. And, and I think we'll talk more about that as well. Let's, let's go back to the music for a moment. There's yes. something that I really, really just love that the synths does. For instance, after the uh, in the second verse, for instance, washed up a new identity, the synth goes down down. Washed up a new identity. It has this recurring kind of trumpet sounding sting. Oh yes, the 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 electric trumpets. Yeah, down, down. <laughs> yeah, yes. Washed up a new identity. I find it so. It is my new electric hand clap i find it so freaking funny and it reminds me of a european band actually called the gypsy kings have you ever heard them yes i think i've heard i think i borrowed your your gypsy kings albums i forgot they existed but yeah i I think i've heard them before they're fantastic they are a spanish roma music influenced band and they have you know they were recording probably around the same time and so there's a lot of synth in their music, which is really funny because it's like traditional Spanish guitar, traditional, you know, Roma singing, and then <laughs> ridiculous synth sounds. There's something very um, guileless about it. And I think, and I feel like I, this sound, hearing the synth in this context gives me that feeling of like, it's silly, but it's, it's earnest, but it's, it doesn't take itself too seriously. It's light. We can hope it doesn't take itself too seriously. Because if it if it does, I think it's really it's really not a successful take. Yeah, it's I think it, in my ear, it doesn't read as being very ponderous or very self aggrandizing. Yeah, it's not the backbone of the song is not reliant on that sound. That's accurate. The, yeah. the backbone of this song is Ian's acoustic guitar, I would venture. Yeah, the flute carries a lot too, I think. I would say that the flute is the engine of the song and the guitar is the chassis. Oh, I was going to say the tracks. I was going I was thinking trains. Trains. Yeah, 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 the flute the flute is not as stable as the acoustic, but it's it's up there. It's up there. Speaking of Martin Barr, I think that his playing, when you do hear it in this song, is really exemplary. And I, I, I tend to agree with Ian, no matter what he says. But also, <laughs> as particularly in this case, I do think that that Martin's guitar playing is really exceptional. And and very, again, you know, going back to the lightness, I love I love that kind of take on this or that that what you've identified in there. There's something not unstrained i would call it not unstrained so strained no i would say it is not strained oh okay it is unstrained gotcha you're just saying overall there's like a a, a light flowingness to this there is yeah i and i think that's one of the things that is so, so drastically different about this song compared to so, the some of the songs on this album that really force that electric sound onto us Yes. Whether it's the synth that I'm growing partial to or the drum machine that I'm still not convinced about. Yes. There's an Italian expression talking about Europe, dolce fer niente, which means it is sweet to do nothing or the sweetness Hmm. of doing nothing, which explains a lot about the Italian economy, but also (laughs) kind of ties into, I think, what Ian is partially tapping into here, this, this, this European sense of being of being relaxed and the music mm-hmm. comes off even even when you have the guitar being very precise and you have the the synth doing a lot of sounds there's a certain sense of of relaxedness it's mm-hmm. intention not tension oh interesting yeah yeah i get that i get that this is the song that you write when you sit down at the coffee shop in the new country that you're visiting yes and you're you don't have the your mind is not oppressed by kind of dull domestic affairs. Yeah. Yeah. You're on vacation. You're someplace new. 
So you're you're not you're not worried about work, you're not worried about cultural mores per se because you don't know them yet. You know, you're kind <sighs> of you're dropped into this this world yeah. and yeah. you can you can kind of experience it and it's it, it, you're not tethered. There is a, a freedom there. Well, and, you know, and we're getting a little bit into the theme here, but, you know, when you do, when you travel, there is this sense of gaining perspective that happens sometimes. And if you, you know, it's very funny. If you, if you live by the mountains, you eventually stop seeing the the beauty of the mountains. Mm -hmm. If you live Mm -hmm. in Paris, you eventually sort of tune out the Eiffel Tower. Right. But when you first get to a new place, there's this sense of like, oh, everything's new. There are infinite possibilities. I could totally be a morning person. (laughs) Yeah. And then a couple of weeks later, you know, your old routines kind of kick in. But there is this there is this moment where you're like, ah, everything is open and expansive. Yeah, it's a it's a new it's a new and foreign and exciting energy. Yeah. I want to talk just going back to the music for a second yep. in the end of the bridge, which I adore the bridge on this song. Mm. Toward the end of the bridge, we have Martin and the keys and the flute all combining And it gives me this very strong sensation of reminding me, it reminds me heavily of the song Hot Mango Flush. Mmm. Okay, yeah. There's that similar mix of of lightness and fast-paced musicality. With a flair for the exotic. With the yes, with a little bit of a yes, with a little bit of exoticism. Yeah. Mango thrown in. Hot mango flush. Yeah, I I see that. I get that. I like that comparison. This is, I prefer this one over hot mango flush, but I I get it. Yeah. But we'll change your mind in two to five years. Who? Yeah. When it, when is, well, you look that up. This song is in four, four as so far, all the songs in this album are which my theory is that's because of the drum machine, because it was not programmable in anything else. (laughs) The middle of April, 2024. Just around the corner. So a year and a half. Yeah. Not far at all. This song is a lovely ditty. When I first heard it, I don't think I really enjoyed it as much as I did the second and third time that I listened to it. I I'm, I'm jamming on it. It's, it's giving me, uh, a full European fantasy, and I'm living for it. I think it's it's a lot like Under Wraps number two in that it's so drastic. Granted, this one is nowhere near as gorgeous as Under Wraps two was, or is, or or as acoustic, or as acoustic. But but there is enough of a drastic difference that this song smacks a lot closer to the tull that we have been listening to up until this point. And it's kind of a nice, it's a nice throwback, you know, it's a nice kind of Island in the, the tumultuous sea that is under wraps. Speaking of throwing it back, let's throw it all the way back to a quick break. Okay. Omen, here we are. We are halfway through, I believe Mary and Marley both have something for us. Mary and Marley. Oh, 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 don't I look gorgeous? Uh, yes, Mary, you look very, very nice. What, what would you, what would you call that garment? It's a kaftan. Okay. Very good. Okay. You get up when you're on your vacation. Oh, hi. I was down on the beaches of Santorini, and. My Greek lover came and, oh, we did all manner of things. Now, is that, it, it was, is that a Greek lover that you return to regularly? Or is that like just for this vacation? Tradition is tradition. My mother had a Greek lover that was his father. My grandmother had a Greek <laughs> lover that was his father. Wow. It goes back generations. That's That's really, you know... We there's something that we really lack with tradition here in the states, and it's, yeah, it's, it's just very, really admirable to see that, Mary. That's great. Yeah, it's really, really, really suffering under the the long term effects of Puritanism. Yeah, 
Yeah. I'm a free woman. Okay. Goodbye. Thank you for that. Th- th- thanks. Oh, she's not wearing underpants. Look at that. Nope. Okay. She is not. Wow. She's not. Okay. Uh, thank you. She Marley. always looks lovely in this light. Oh, Marley. That's Marley. can't can't imagine gonna, how that's appropriate. We're gonna unpack all that later. Yeah. In the meantime, it looks like Mary gave me a, a small piece of paper in which she has transcribed in pastels this um, what I assume is an email or. Oh, oh, it's a review, I see. Oh my goodness, a review. It's been so long. <gasps> Sir, sensors have detected another star in the sky. Dear Lord, that's five stars. Five stars. Five stars. That fade is so long. I love it. It is a long one. <laughs> this is indeed a five-star review from Woodface via op- Apple Podcasts from Great Britain. Very funny, Woodface. Also, if you translate it directly to French, it means hangover, gueule du bois. Woodface says, title, The Best Jethro Tull Podcast. This is a great example of what's possible with a podcast. Hosted by two funny, knowledgeable, and humble guys that don't pretend they have all the answers and are happy to be corrected by their increasing following of Tull Skulls. Recommended. Simple and sweet. You say how it is? Greatly appreciated, Woodface. Woodface, you are a true poet and a valued listener. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you. the five stars and thank you for thank you for noticing how humble we are, honestly. <laughs> it's it's about time people recognize that. It's about time someone noticed <laughs> how thank humble you we are. So much for that, Woodface. Genuinely, everyone else leave us a, a review and a rating, please, if you don't mind. So Mary gave you that. Marley very distractedly thrust some papers into my hand. He wasn't looking at me when he did. And you didn't even notice me, new Greek hat. Oh. I, I'm i starting to put some pieces together here. It's, not, it's best not to inquire any yeah, further. I, I, have, uh, I have an email, though, from oh a previous writer inner. Oh, my this gosh. This is from our friend of the pod, Jameson. Jameson writes an email entitled Rhythm in Gold. Mm-hmm. Momes, just listened to the Rhythm and Gold episode while walking the dog. Momtastic as usual. Wanted to suggest imagining the high-class lady in the lyric as metaphor for an actual rhythmic pattern, which Ian, having seen it in a vision, is trying to describe, convey, articulate, demonstrate, etc. to the band, the boys. Oh my. So that they can catch it or pin it down, understand it and play it, i.e. realize the track. This seems especially likely if the song took shape, as Barry Barlow has noted about earlier recording sessions, with the music being created before the lyric, the band having no knowledge of what the song was about or where and how the vocal would fit in. Perhaps Ian hit on the metaphor of the creeper, no novelty in the tall canon, mm. to find words and a vocal delivery that not only helped to convey the feel and tone of his original vision, but also to smooth over the somewhat jagged overlapping percussion figures in the track they had created, making it easier for the listener to absorb all the complexity at work in the dynamics of the instruments to follow Ian and the boys as they chase down the rhythm and gold. Moreover, our bard beset by beasties uses the last verse to deftly convey something about the process of learning and creating and playing music, especially with other people, in the realization that she, the rhythm or the muse, belongs to everyone. Hmm. And the pursuit has yielded something, the track, while at the same time proving to have been sort of a cosmic fool's errand, a denouement that is actually a continuation of a mystical musical process. This interpretation, especially in the context of the beastie theme of the album, also helps me to feel less icky, or perhaps has grown entirely out of my mind expressly in order to feel less icky while listening to this song, particularly lines about immobilizing and sabotaging her resources for help and escape. Side note, surely Ian is punning on the double meaning of 911 as a Porsche and the American emergency phone number. Shudder. I hope our narrator somehow kept going from you belong to everyone to I should really examine my attitudes toward women. <laughs> anyway, these be some of my thoughts. It's always the most surprising episodes that make me want to weigh in. Thanks, as always, for the tall itches you scratch. Broadest of swords to you both, Jameson. 
Chavis, and thank you so much for writing and for your thoughts that you've conveyed. You know, regardless of whether or not that was the intention behind the song, that is a brilliant interpretation. And I think really is a beautiful illustration of something that I have definitely experienced with the creative process, which is sometimes you get, as if it comes from completely outside of your own brain, a flash of inspiration. Mm -hmm. And if you cannot effectively write it down or translate it or communicate it to other people that you're working with, you risk losing it. Right. Yeah. You you can only do so much on your part if it is, if it, it is required to be collaborative. Absolutely. And in a way you feel like you're, you feel like you're caretaking this idea, bringing it to fruition. It's not even yours. It doesn't even necessarily feel mm. like it's yours. And I can imagine that uh, an artist of Ian's caliber could perhaps have access to these inspirations from the universe that, that are so perfect as to be golden, you know, the kind of the golden ratio of the kind of alchemical dimensions to inspiration mm-hmm. is really intriguing. Again, no idea if it's an accurate interpretation, but as we've said, every interpretation is as valid as anyone else's. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's a great, I love that interpretation of, the, of uh, rhythm and gold. Well done. Very cool. It's very kind of fourth wall breaking. It's there. There's a, there's a self-reference and a self-knowledge there. I like it a lot. It's very clever. But without being so kind of twee as something like the horrible musical, which I hate and a lot of people love, called Name of Show. Oh, I don't even know that one. Don't even bother looking it up. <laughs> I won't. At nameofshow.com <laughs> backslash the musical. <laughs> and if you go to the cast, you'll see Omen Said is the first person. <laughs> Nick, anything else? That is it for correspondence. I think we can dive back into the episode. All right. I'm going to just have a quick spritz of this Rosewater Facial Toner. Oh, 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 I'm, I'm so jealous. Hydrated. I'm refreshed. And let's get back to the regular episode. That was me toes water. Oh, to- a to- toes water. Did you misread uh, that, Omen? That I, I have... A terrible skin condition now. Uh, terrible mistake. I have athlete's foot on my cheeks. <laughs> athlete's face. <laughs> okay, here we are. Welcome back, Omen. Ready to get into the the content, the lyrics, the story behind or inside of European legacy. Let's do that. But before we do, let's talk a little bit about, you know, what is Europe? I know that sounds like a, like a daft, simplistic question, but I don't know that it is. Well, for those who are geographically challenged like myself, I think it's, I think it's a good question to address before we get into things here. Well, and the, the kind of interesting thing is you can, you can approach the question from several standpoints. You can say Europe is a geographical entity. It is a series of countries. It's a continent, right? It's one of the continents. You could say it's a continent, yes. But but on the other hand, it's like, well, where is the division in that continent between Asia, Asia Major, Major Asia, and Europe? There's no actual border there. Right, yeah, that's true, yeah. We talk about Western Europe versus Eastern Europe. You, you know, we have the political definition of Europe. We have the EU. Mm-hmm which started after World War II and was was really just, I think, five countries, Germany, France, Italy, Spain, maybe another one. And then that's expanded. So other countries, you know, it's a trade union. So other countries have joined the EU and then that's eventually that uh, took on political power. There's the euro itself, the, the currency, which connects a lot of Europe. But at the same time, you know, not every country is on the euro or a part of the EU. Right. So there's lots of, you know, there's, there's lots of kind of ways of, of defining it or, or specifying it. There's the Schengen zone, which is different from the European Union. You know, so there's this kind of overlapping ideas. Really, when you get down to it, I think Europe as a concept is not particularly well defined and somewhat vague. Particularly, I think in the States, we kind of blanket term, oh, oh it's, it's Europe. It's, it's European. And that's an important reminder to as we approach this song i think that it's easy as americans to think ah oh, yes england is part of europe or the the british isles are part of europe and geographically you know you, there's a there's a big argument for that politically 
there is a much less of an argument for it now than there was a couple of years yeah, ago. Yeah, right, right. You know, and so the question of the the difference, the separation between Britain and Europe has always been – there's always been some cultural tension there and some political tension there. Yeah. But I also think that it's important to remember like from a – from the perspective of a British person, neither of which we are. Correct. The idea of the continent – the mainland Europe is as foreign perhaps as it is to us in America. Right. Europe has Europe in air quotes, I suppose Europe has such a broad footprint that it really encompasses so much more than the the States does. And, and therefore has so many more differing cultures. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, and then there are, you know, if you look at what's happening with Ukraine at the moment, you know, you the Ukraine would like to join the European Union, yeah, because there because there's the there's NATO and there's the protection that that comes along with it. But is Ukraine European? I mean, that's that's a question that's 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 unanswerable. Yeah, Russia would say no. Russia would say yet, but there is an argument to say that Russia is a European country, right? You know, and then we get into cultural Europeanism. One argument is to say that Europe is the are the countries that were whose culture is primarily affected by the ancient Greek and Roman civilizations, like Ang- Anglo-Saxon, basically. Yeah, or 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 Western in that kind of yeah. classical sense of of the word. But of course, you know that's not really something you can hang your hat on because there are now people from all kinds of backgrounds who are European. They're you know, tons of North Africans who live in France and there's a lot of racism in France. So, you know, this question, this question of like, what is Europe? Oh, it's European is very, I think it changes to suit the requirements of the speaker often. Sure. Right. The user of the term European. Right. But in this case, I think what we are looking at is Europe as opposed to Britain or as opposed to England. So the continent. Okay. So that more exotic land that you, you have to go to the main body of the the continent. Exactly. Okay. Across the channel. There's a lot of geographical references in this song. Mm -hmm. So that out of the way, what I'm questioning with this song is, do we approach it face value or do we try to fit it into the spy novel world? I think let's do the latter first. Let's do the f- the fatter lurst. Let's do that one. Yeah. It kind of smacks of under wraps in a way that it 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 kind of feels like like a honey pot like he's falling for the he's falling for his mark an intrigue. Yeah, he's Svetlana is so exotic and from the main continent and he's seducing her, but I think he's falling for her as well. Yes, yes. I'll shoot on sight is kind of the, that's the bit that that ties it to the spy world to me. Yeah, right, right. But also this sense that that it maybe is a a pan-European journey that they're on, you know. Nouvelle Cuisine or an oyster bar, it's really up to her. You know, sort of like, oh, yes, well, we'll just go and we'll go to Florence for lunch. Right. There's that sense of freewheelingness. Yeah. And it's it's to maybe it's his his fake identity. You know, he's he's flashing the money. He's he's trying to to make her fall for him. He's trying to gain her trust, to gain her trust and present himself as someone that clearly wouldn't be a spy. He's making such a big presentation of things, you know. Yeah. Who, who knows? I, that's. I mean, that's all. That's all serious interpretation here. But, but it 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 definitely feels like like something is coming to a head at this point. Yeah, it's a, it's like the honeymoon phase of a James Bond movie. Yeah, it's going to evolve or devolve and and get more complex as the album goes on. I think that's a good take on it. So now I want to move back to the the more face value interpretation. Okay, which is to me this seems like a the 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 lady the she is ian's personification of europe yeah 
She smiles at me from beyond the eastern seashore. She smiles at me from beyond the eastern seashore. There's this draw to leave England, to leave Scotland, and to go to the continent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm reminded of the fact that there was this whole period of time where Ian Anderson was very, very close to moving the entire operations of the band to Switzerland. Yeah, that was Passion Play? Around that time, yeah. Yeah, because that was the Chateau Disastre. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So there's this sense, I get kind of interpolating from that. My sense is, ah, yes, Europe, where where I'm appreciated and not taxed within an inch Mm, of my life. Sure, right. Yeah, and he can then therefore write every check that she brings to him. He can afford to write the checks, you know? I'll write every check she brings to me. That's a line that I'm quite confused and stuck on. I think it's just a matter of, well, I mean, now that you bring up the taxes, that in a way that sounds like like paying your taxes, but also in a sense... We we've got the the Nouvelle Cuisine or, or or an oyster bar. It seems like he's he's willing to pay. He's he's he wants to go and spend his money and enjoy his experience over there. I'll pay any bill she brings to me. Yeah, whether it's for oysters or or a castle or a trip to the Eiffel Tower or whatever, you know. Yes, a castle, a castle. Anything for after dinner? Ice cream? A castle? Can. I know it's probably not, like, standard, but can I get ice cream in the castle? Oh, yes, a, a casfagato. I'll, I'll pay extra. I know it's, that's probably, like, yeah. <laughs> no, no. We'll cover it in espresso as well. Oh, great. Perfect. I think that there's, I think that we're stumbling against a Britishism here, and I'm not sure on which side we're stumbling. I'll write every check she brings me, she brings to me, could mean, as you're saying, I'll write, I'll sign my name for any bill. Right. What we would call a bill in a restaurant. Check, please. Yeah. They bring you the check. Or he's saying, I'll cash every check that she offers me. If someone, if some European tour agency is like, hey, we want you to do 10 nights in, in Germany. I'll be like, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, I'll yeah. do that. I'll be on a plane there tomorrow. Or I'll cancel the Swindon Hippodrome. <laughs> or going, going back to the tax thing. It doesn't, I'm not sure it quite works with the whole specific terminology of European here, but Maybe maybe he's willing to pay those taxes because he loves his country. But he, w- he wouldn't be saying European there, right? Uh, uh, I don't maybe. know. I don't know. Or maybe this, is fa- maybe this is his fantasy of becoming a European and therefore having to pay lower taxes. Right. This is his fantasy of the La Dolce Vita. Yeah. A couple of geographical references. The Channel's Wide. The Channel's Wide. Of course, this is a reference to the English Channel, mm-hmm. which at its... Thin point is so thin that you can literally see France from right. the shores of England. We've talked about that on a previous uh, episode. On whiter cliffs, I'm high. On whiter cliffs, I'm high. I believe that refers to the cliffs of Dover, the white chalk cliffs, which rise strikingly out of the sea in England. That is part of the English Channel. So, you know, if you were sailing from France or flying from France, you would see it. Mm. And if you were standing on those cliffs, you would be gazing toward France and, and the rest of Europe. Okay. Is there a geographical location known as the Highlands, or is that just a broader term? About the highlands and the islands. I think he's sort of saying, you know, like, as the American propagandic song says, from sea to shining sea, mm. I think he's sort of saying the breadth and span of this, sure. of this place. The Highlands and the Islands. There's so much of her Europe to explore. Yeah, okay. It's a little bit of a... a a sexualization of a geographical area. Right, right. It is it is allegorical for the naughty bits. It is sexagorical. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, kind of, there's something funny about Ian's perspective in the second verse. And I think it's only funny because we're Americans, but, you know, as Americans, we always think like, oh, you know, everything in England is so old, everything in Europe is so old. And of course it is. But Ian is saying, ah, yes, here in Europe, round the castle walls, around the highlands and the islands, the faint reminder stands of visitors who took her hands a thousand years ago or so. The faint reminder stands of visitors who took her hands a thousand years ago or so. 
you know, the kind of, maybe it's the Romans, maybe it's the, the cultures that predated the Romans, but yeah. it's sort of him sensing that depth of history and maybe not saying, maybe, you know, logically we're not saying, oh, everything in England is new, but just that this, there's something about this land, this, this Europe that's so intriguing that there've been, and so fertile for civilization that there've been so many civilizations that have risen and fallen in that area. And to carry on with that, the next lines, stranded high and dry by tides, washed up a new identity. Stranded high and dry by tides, washed up a new identity. They came to this land, made it their own. They they became something more than what they were before that. Same thing with Ian. He's coming over here and he's creating himself anew. He is. He wants to yeah. be something more than what he is. And who knows, just like you're, you're saying, oh my God, Nick, you're a genius. I know. I know, man. I, you're, <laughs> you're like, I literally have it on this plaque on the wall that I got from my third grade teacher. Just like the various cultural groups who have come in and out of Europe have left their mark. Mm-hmm. Ian is perhaps wondering what is his mark on this landscape, on this culture? What is his European legacy? Sure, right. I had this moment recently where I was I was kind of struck by the way that culture moves and and preserves itself and survives. Santa Fe is one of the longest occupied cities in the United States. Oh cool. In the current United States because it was originally founded as a town by in its current form by the Spanish. Right. Coming up from what's now Mexico. The conquistadors literally thems. Yeah. So Santa Fe, New Mexico was for more of its history, part of the Spanish empire than it has been part of the United States. Wow. That's cool. There's a church downtown I was passing by and I was looking at this church and I was like, man, that architecture is so distinct. And it really reminds me of like, it's, it's Moorish, like the way that the arches were formed, Mm -hmm. the way that the kind of layers and the, the domes, the shape of everything. It was, it's, totally like Southern Spanish Moorish architecture. So when the, when the people from the North of Africa went across the Mediterranean and conquered Spain, they left their mark on the culture, which was various forms of music and this, these beautiful forms of architecture. Mm -hmm. And so then seeing that in this, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away, because that idea of architecture was transmitted all the way up through what's now Mexico. It just blew my mind. Yeah. It's this, you know, this, this connection to North Africa here in the middle of the United States. Yeah. It's so fun. It's pretty neat to think about. And, and unfortunately, most of American culture has been whitewashed. So we really don't get to experience that. But if you look closely. Right. You have to do your own sleuthing to find it, but it's there. Yeah. Certainly not in New England, but. Well, <laughs> I, I want to go to, to I want to I pull out a couple of lines that really fit with just really hammer home the idea of of Ian being of, of being drawn from England to to this mainland with the the tail end the the last bit of the third verse. I hear distant mainland music echo in my island ears. My feet begin to move instinctively to the warmer beat of my European legacy. I hear distant mainland music echo in my island ears. My feet begin to move instinctively to the warmer beat of my European legacy. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. There is a siren's call. There is something kind of in the DNA that is is responding that he he just feels that pull. It's like it's like when salmon know where to go to spawn or sea turtles know which beach to return to 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 lay their eggs, you know. Yes. I always go back to Europe to spawn. If you don't lay your eggs on that beach in Scotland, you know for sure that your babies will not hatch. That's right. That's right. They know. They know. They can taste the water. Yeah. Well, and, you know, a lot of British people do go on holiday in Southern Europe. Sure. If you go to Southern Spain, the signs, you know, in, in certain towns, the population of, of 
the holiday makers is so such a huge part of the population mm-hmm. that literally the street signs are in Spanish, German, and English. Oh wow. Yeah. Nouvelle cuisine versus an oyster bar. Fun little kind of dive into that. One might, you know, from an American perspective, think, ah yes, you know, an oyster bar is something modern, a nouvelle cuisine is something more traditional. It's actually the opposite. Nouvelle cuisine, mm. new cuisine was invented yeah. in the 1960s to kind of distinguish itself from the traditional heavier French cuisine. And oyster bars go back hundreds of years. Oh, sure. So it's kind of like, it's there's kind of a fun play there, but also, you know, a nouvelle cuisine has this association with being very high society, more expensive. An oyster bar potentially is, depending on the kind of oyster bar it is, might be a little divier. Yeah, right, right. Is nouvelle cuisine haute cuisine? Haute cuisine is a little bit of an older term. It actually comes mm. more from the 1920s, and it's it's more on the traditional side of cooking, but the presentation is very, very, very fancy. Gotcha. Haute means okay. high, so high cuisine. It's like the fanciest of fancy French food. Gotcha. Interesting. But Nouvelle cuisine lightened everything and made it less caloric. Mm. I only ate beans out of a can when I was in France. French beans, though. So, you know, I mean, there was that. Yeah. Yes, lentils. Lentils in a can? Oh, sure. Wow. So just to tie a bow on all of this. Yes. We have one of these very traditional Andersonian flips of lyrics. The first verse ends with, I'll shoot on sight. It's my European legacy. Mm -hmm. We end the song with, she shoots on sight. It's a European legacy. Yeah. What do you make of that flip? So I feel like there's always a key in the flip. I, th- I feel like that really, like you said earlier when we, we were talking about the spy novel aspect of it, mm-hmm. that that really hammers home that side of things is uh, we start out with a shoot on site. It's my European legacy. He's going. He's got his head in the game. He's ready to be a super spy. He's got his license to kill. He's got his license to kill. It's freshly laminated. He's good to go. As we go further on... <laughs> We talk about a new identity. We talk about the channel being wide, but it's their European legacy. He feels an an instinctive movement pulling him to a European legacy. And then she shoots on sight. Yeah. It's her European legacy. He has fallen in love with his mark. And the fantastic thing is I think that that journey, that emotional journey works, whether it's the spy novel or whether it's Ian's tales of touring in Europe. Yeah. Right. Ah, we've got a contract for you in Europe. Fantastic. I'll go and make a ton of money and just bring it back home and I'll take I'll take Europe for all it's worth. And then yeah. you go there and you start touring and you're like, oh no. Oh no, it's stolen my soul. Maybe maybe I should go and live here. Maybe I should never have left. Yeah, I think there are a comfortable bog. I think there there are there aren't that many places like that in the States. But I know I've heard plenty of stories of people who like went to visit New Orleans and then never left. Yeah, that's a very good comparison. Like there's a magic there. I've never been, but you shouldn't. You shouldn't or you'll never you'll never come back. Oh, right. Yeah. My wife would be very upset. Rick will be singing the House of the Rising Sun the rest of his life. (laughs) Uh, Santa Fe is a bit like that as well. Then that's a common thing you hear here. People are like, yeah, I came here and just never left. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, I'm sure places in California are the same. That Yeah, that would have been my next guess, yeah. And that's it. And that's Nowhere it. else. No one else can claim it. Except for... Peoria. Except for Peoria, Illinois. <laughs> Nick, anything else to say about European leg assy? N- nothing for my leg assy. Next week, we are going to cover track number four. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I know what it is. I know Do what it is. Do you know what it is? It's called Later That Same Evening. I don't know the last time you were able to name the song for next week. I'm very impressed. Thank you. Even if it's literally on the computer in front of you, I'm it still It literally impressed. is. <laughs> That's right. Track number four, later that same evening. Until then, don't hoist your skirts too high, because then you won't have any room for your Talk Told Me t-shirt. 
which you can get from our T Public Store. The link to which can be found in our show notes. I'm questioning your understanding of what it means to hike one's skirts. I mean, if you're really lifting it up. <laughs> if you are feeling stranded high and dry by tides, why don't you wash yourself up a new identity by subscribing to our Patreon, which will give you access to our Discord chat, where you can chat with other people who have subscribed to our Discord chat. <laughs> as well as two additional podcasts a month. And when you're done leaving a restaurant review for the Nouvelle Cuisine and Oyster Bar, please give us a five-star rating and review in your podcatcher of choice. Until next week, I am the warmer beat, Omen Thomas said. I am the visitor who took your hand a thousand years ago, Nick McGill. <laughs> we are a wide channel, the Feckless Momes. And this is the podcast legacy honoring the European legacy. Talk tell to me. Uh, ah, bonsoir, monsieur. Uh, welcome to Roger Le Grand Nuit Restaurant. Uh, my name is Philippe, and I am so pleased to have you sit just here on this, uh, how you say, chaise. Oh, thank you so much, Philip. That's really nice of you. I, I appreciate that. So, I don't know if you could tell I'm not really a local. I'm looking but to... you don't say. I, I do say, I do. And I'm, I'm looking to experience the local cuisine. Ah... What is your name? I did not. Uh, I did not uh, hear it when you made your introductions. Uh, my name's Herschel. Ah, Herschel is. Uh, you have come to the right place here at Chez Roger Leroy. We are always happy to introduce even the uh, les idiots Americains, as we say, to uh, the jewels of our French uh, culture. Uh, here is the carte de cuisine. Here you can see the uh, written out. I assume you can um, uh, read. Yeah, yes, I, I can read. Thank ah, you. Ah, that good. Yes, we also have a picture menu for the people from Louisiana. M may I have the the picture? You can have a both. Menu. Thank, thank, thank you. You're very sweet. I'm going to start with some Mountain Dew to begin mm, with, mm, mm, mm. and uh, I see that you've got yourselves a bit of a soup here. Mm -hmm. It's Blanket de Vio. Ah, oui, yes, uh, le blanket de veau. Uh, let me just uh, sit upon uh, your lap in the traditional French method. Oh, oh, and I explain do. to you that uh, with the blanket de veau, we take, how uh, you say, a baby cow. A baby cow. Oh, a veal? Yes, baby, baby cow, and we murder it straight away. It come out of the mama cow and chop, it is dead. Oh, that's quick. Oh, yes, and then we, it hasn't even come out of the poop hole yet. And then we cut it into a very thin slices, and we put it with a beautiful butter, le beurre, and you eat it down, and you feel so good because the murder makes it taste so fresh. Interesting. I didn't expect it to be so graphic. Uh, let, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go perhaps... Oh, I, I think this looks pretty good. Hmm, I'm, I, I might not pronounce this correctly. Is it pisseldieri? Ah, yes, the pisseldieri. Uh, that is a, a, a lovely, wonderful, uh, heartwarming dish from the south of France. And what we do is we make a, a bulle. You say a bulle, a dough, I believe. And we make it a very thin. And then a slap, slap. We take the fishes, a whack, whack. And we put them on there. And then uh, we cook it. And it is amazing for the breakfast. We always like to have the, the fish for breakfast because it stays with us. And so we can put extra anchovies on it and make it a very, very salty you will love. I'm not a, not a terribly fond of anchovies. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. I think I'm going to play it safe and go for the cock oven. Ah, yes, the coq vin, very good, yes. What we do is we take a, uh, a male rooster, and once he has called 1,001 times, we immediately kill him dead. When the very 1,001st kikri di 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 is still fresh in his throat, we strangle him with our bare hands. You see the feathers on my hands. You see them. Smell my hands. 
It's oh yes, very, very, it's very, very graphic. I don't really yes, need to graphic, know how yes, to yes, do yes. it. We put the rooster in. We drown him in the wine. We boil it until until we start to faint with hunger, and then we serve it to you, our American friend. Oh, okay. I think I think I'll just I'll start with the Mountain Dew and maybe a, 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 a an appetizer of the foie gras. Ah, the foie gras, yes, very good. Uh, you will love to hear how we make this. We take a goose, oh, a goose, yes, and we staple his legs to the floor so he cannot move. Tac, tac, staple to floor. And then we first feed him podcast after podcast, only the freshest to fatten his brain. And then we cut out his brain and we mush it into a gentle syrup until you can smell it. And the last thing the goose says before it is Dead is Paleta la moi. C'est un fier membre du réseau à dire irresponsable, Moms. That, that sound. I, I think I'm just gonna go get a Big Mac if you don't mind. It is too late. We've already stapled your feet to the floor. Enjoy your Mountain Dew. Oh no! <laughs> so dumb.